I'm here with Nancy and I discovered her garden just as being a neighbor to one of my projects and it's uh, it's stunning in the sense that I haven't seen anything like it in Marin and so I thought I'd let her walk through the process of turning a patch of lawn this size into what you see right here. Hello there. Happy to talk to you about the garden. This was previously a lawn uh, about four years ago and we decided to um, open it up and try and bring in some native uh, plants and some, a lot of blooming plants for um, butterflies to get a uh, basically a way station going for monarchs and um, started slow. Uh, what was your first step? Did you desod it or did you kind of put cardboard and, and stuff on it? Uh, we, uh, we killed it, uh, killed the grass, and it took about three weeks and uh, then just began planting. Mm -hmm. Did you rototill the old sod in? We did not. Okay. We just started planting right, uh -huh. into, the, right into the sod. All right. And what do you know how many varieties you have in this bed here? Uh, dozens and dozens. Okay. Because uh, it's it's la it's done in layers. Okay. So my hope is when one uh, one item stop, stops, another will begin to continue the nectar for uh, the butterfly migration. So okay. when the butterflies are here, um, they they have a constant food source from spring to fall. So uh, let's maybe you can point out some of the varieties yeah. to to get a sense of uh, yeah. how to replicate something well, like the, this. The, the butterflies are heavily interested in nectar. So we have Leatris, which is a wonderful bulb that comes up uh, um, strong every year. We have Echinacea, which gets um, spreads and comes up beautifully every year. Uh, we have Cosmos, uh, probably the butterflies, very, very favorite, and it's a, a native to the Bay Area, is Verbena. Um, out of all the flowers we have in here, this is their go-to um, plant. It reseeds all by itself beautifully every year. Uh, there's really no fuss to it whatsoever. Just you put it in and you're done. It just reseeds beautifully for us. We have Black-Eyed Susan that reseeds. We have the Queen Anne's Lace right here that reseeds beautifully. Uh, we've got, um, it's really important to have vines as well. There's a, uh, a different type of butterfly that likes that uh, uh, type of vine, the Gulf Fritillera butterfly. Uh, they, they love to, uh, that's their host plant. Um, how, how many butterflies have you have you counted in terms of different varieties in uh, here? There's a there's at least um, about six to ten mm -hmm. different butterflies that are consistently in here. Mm -hmm. um, that it looks are, like you've got honeybees as well. A lot of honeybees, uh, a lot of bumblebees, mm. uh, a lot of hummingbirds. A lot of other little birds that are noshing on the little seeds from the plants as well. Now, now, did you buy this as a as a trellis sold as a trellis, or did you just cut a four by eight panel in half and no. zip tie it together? Uh, I bought it as a trellis. Okay. And just strapped it together to give it a little bit more support. Mm -hmm. Seems to work great in the garden. It doesn't tip over or blow over in the wind. Mm -hmm. And what is the important? You said vines are important. Uh, what role do they do they play? Well, this the the role that they'll play is they'll bloom uh, well into the winter mm. here in our Bay Area. So it's gonna it's a great food source for the butterflies. I see. Uh, where everything, the other plants are all dying back. Um, we'll have the vines that will keep blooming and blooming and blooming until we start to get severe weather, which is... Um, is that a passiflora? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you know the variety? 
I don't okay. off the top of my hand. I could look it up and, and get it to you, but uh, this is uh, just beginning. I have one in the backyard that's um, fully engulfed and it's just spectacular and mm -hmm. it's just loaded with butterflies as well. And the dwarf olives that you have, other than winter uh, structure, what do, do they provide anything in terms of, of habitat? Well, they do. Um, any these this this type of a bush is a great place for the butterflies to hide and protect themselves from predators. Um, it's also very easy to grow. It's drought tolerant. Um, it's easy to maintain. It makes a nice little border in the yard as well. Mm -hmm. Then you have it looks like milkweed back there. Uh, we have the native milkweed. Yes, the. Um, that's the Davis, or it's called showy milkweed coming up. Mm -hmm. That's with the big bloom. Okay. Uh, one, of, one of the monarch's favorite, and they're, it's their host plant. It's the only thing they'll eat and lay their eggs on. Mm. So it's a very, very important um, element in your garden if you're gonna have butterflies. And you got some sunflowers. Yeah, this is a native. This particular sunflower is called Delta. Mm. And it um, tends to be deer resistant. Mm. And um, how, how is this overall garden for deer resistance? It is 100% deer resistant. Interesting. And okay. these are, um, a lot of these plants are actually toxic. Mm. Um, they, not not they, to butterflies, but to Not to butterflies, yeah. but to, uh, to, to your skin. You have to be careful because a lot of the, the plants that are toxic to deer are going to be um, uh, present problems for your for your skin when the when the liquid comes out of them. So you do have to wear gloves and be careful when you're um, handling this, some of these um, plants. It looks like you have is, it, is this chamomile or what is the the little miniature daisy there? Uh, that is feverfew. Okay, feverfew. And again, very deer resistant. It reseeds. Uh, you'll get lots and lots of it. Mm -hmm. And then is this uh, dahlia or what's this? Uh, dahlias. Dahlias, okay. Uh, um, dahlias are wonderful right here in the Bay Area. How do, you, how do you manage slugs? I don't see slug damage there. I um, don't tend to get too much slug damage as long as the plants are in full sun. Uh -huh. When you start to get shady areas, uh, they, I tend to get more of a slug problem and I will um, use Sluggo, which mm. is a... Um, environmentally friendly product to use. Mm -hmm. But the, um, back to the dahlias quickly, most areas you have to dig the dahlia bulbs up. I see. In our area, we are so lucky we don't have to dig those up. They just get bigger and better every year. And then it, that looks like a, perhaps a salvia? Salvia, yes. Which, do you know which variety? I believe it's Mystic Spires. Mystic Spire. Another great, salvias are fantastic for us here in the Bay Area too. And, and then, uh, this variety right here. We've got Ostromeria. Ostromeria. It just uh, thrives and spreads beautifully in our area. It looks like Delphinium. Delphiniums do well. A little bit um, trickier to grow. You have to uh, give them a little bit more care than most. And this is a cat mint. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, now are there different varieties yes, of Nepeta? Yes, there are. There are. There are, and uh, sorry, I don't know, know the name of it off the top of my head. Okay, and um, did, the, at, you know, see, so this is four years old. At what point did it look this nice? Or is this the, is this the nicest it's ever looked? Actually, the, the, this is probably the fullest it's ever looked, mm -hmm. but it really looked nice right from the get-go. Okay. It, uh, it, it was always, it's always evolving, it's always changing, but it looked nice from the beginning. How many hours a year uh, uh, of your time is invested in this, just this one bed, would you say? Well, it's, um, it's really not a yearly uh, event. Uh, there's... Um, no, you're out here all the time, but I'm wondering what does it add up to uh, or is it easier for you to calculate monthly? Yeah, it's probably, I probably spend a, um, 
I probably spend about 10 hours a month a a week 10 hours a week in this little oh, no, just this no no just this probably an, an hour, about an hour a week okay at, at the most all right it, it pretty much maintains itself mm -hmm. uh, I like the um, and would that stay so yearly that that could be 50 hours a year would 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 you say it's you know less than an hour a week in the winter months uh, the winter months there's 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 not much at all okay so maybe 30 hours a year yeah that sounds about right to to at, at, at the most yeah, yeah. okay because when you once once something is planted and then it blooms it will usually stay in the bed for about six weeks or so mm -hmm. until something else is ready to pop up and that particular plant is ready to go mm -hmm. so that's kind of the cycle about every about every six to eight weeks something will stop and something else will start with the exception of some of our fabulous natives that look that are just bloom busters they'll go from they'll go from spring to uh, fall things like verbena and it looks like you have inline emitter drip. Yeah, that was a that was a first this year. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, until the until that started, it was hand water because okay. it really didn't require as much wa that much water, so mm -hmm. I just hand watered it. And have you have you run that every eighteen inches, every foot? Uh, the, that is um, every six inches. So, is is the is the inline drip? Yes. And how closely spaced are the two are the tubes? Uh, they're pretty spread out. They're snaked. They're just snaked throughout that garden. Not okay. nothing too close together. And it seems to be doing the job just fine. Indeed. Um, the roots. So, so that and reach out and find that water. And the the brown tubing makes it easier to conceal. Uh, relative to black and probably also some something you can have trouble with on really hot days like like today if the emitter tubing is exposed to the Sun mm. it'll become like swimming pool heaters up on a roof okay. and it'll it, the water will come close to, to boiling and then when you first drip the plants it can kill the plants just by basically pouring hot water on them and so you have to keep you have to keep enough shade which you're obviously doing by putting it in amongst established plants uh -huh. uh, so that if it's on the surface you know in there you you don't you know dose your because That's yeah all the all the water in the line is is what heats up uh -huh. and so your very first watering can be you know like five minutes of really hot water oh interesting and then it it, it cools cools down as it you know runs through the drip line but you're not having a problem with that no and my goal is to completely cover it yeah mm -hmm. it was put it was put in this year right before things started popping up and mm -hmm. then things started popping up so quickly i really couldn't go in without breaking things and cover it so I'm hoping in the fall to get that all covered, mm -hmm. so none of the none of the pipe is exposed. Yeah, well, it's it's a very simple thing. Anywhere you see a bit, you can scatter a little bit of of aged wood fines or a bit of you know throw a bit of mulch over it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because soil is very good insulation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what's your setting for uh, for the water? Like, how often do you run for how many minutes? And do you know how many gallons per hour per inline drip? Yes, we've we've got. Uh, to my knowledge, it's a it's a half a gallon per hour. Yep, that's the smallest drip you can get, and that that gives you the ability to run up uh, to have about three hundred drippers on one zone. Mm, okay. Um, be okay. because otherwise it's it's. If you run the well, yeah. If, if you run, the, I usually install every 12 inch, every 18 inch drippers, mm -hmm. and so if you run around 300 feet of line, by the end of it, all that water going through a tiny little half inch pipe uh, and bleeding out all the drippers, it it doesn't put quite as much at the end. Toward the end, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but uh, that makes sense. Yeah, but half half gallon per hour is is 
is uh, is great because it gives you the most amount of line per zone. Mm -hmm. um, so and, it's about every other day right now, why it's warm uh -huh. and everything's in bloom. Yeah. But I'm still tinkering with it and playing with it a little bit. Right. Uh, to make sure that it's all absorbing and not running out the on the street. So it is a little bit of a technique to play with it. Mm -hmm. And it, and the garden's completely evolving and changing right. all the time. So you can't. I'm finding it. I can't just. This isn't the kind of garden where I can just set the timer on and have it do what uh, and water and expect it to be the same now as it, as it is in three months. You have to keep an eye on it. Have you looked at the on-site weather stations uh, no. to monitor your timer up and down? I have not. Okay, so that, yeah. that, that, that can help with a little bit of that variation. Yeah, that would make sense too. Some days when it's cold and foggy, we're not going to need to have the water on. Is that right. what you're saying? Exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, are there any other plants that we have missed? Because we've got about a dozen, but we've got the cotinus, a smoke bush back there. Yeah. Now, is there any reason the leaves are not more purple at, uh, at this time? Or was I'm, that... I'm guessing it's just uh, where it's placed in the yard. Um, I have them in the backyard, and they all seem to be similar mm -hmm. right now. Uh, I do have to be careful with those kind of plants. They have to sit on the outside of the garden because they don't like as much water as the inside of the garden mm -hmm. um, so when you are when you do have a lot of things in bloom they're going to take more water than obviously um, other other things like the like the smoke bush and the olive so i really keep the water more centered in the middle of the garden and let the water just kind of naturally drip out to the drought tolerant things indeed so as we go in here i see some hellebore uh they did fantastic this year too and they're not they're not burning in this amount of sun this is the this particular area gets the most sun for them and they yeah. still come up beautifully every year beautiful yeah. lavender like this smoke bush has the the color i really like uh do, any idea what's what's different about this smoke bush versus the one over there you know they're they're two different um, smoke bush, it's two different smoke bush. They seem to have the same type of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, completely different colors. Uh, my only um, comment is that they're different colors. They seem to behave in a similar way. Right. They don't like a lot of water. So what is this bush, this lovely? Uh, that's uh, blue hibiscus. Blue hibiscus. Uh, drought tolerant wonderful in the Bay Area mm. and it will bloom, it bloom, blooms pretty much all year with the exception of our um, real real cold months but for the most part it, it blooms. It loves to be pruned really hard. And you've got peonies here? Peonies, yes. I love the smell of peonies. Yeah, they're wonderful. And then here you've got some dahlias in, in bloom and then you've got clematis. Do you know the varieties of clematis? Um, I would have to look them up. And then you've got honeysuckle on that trellis. Yeah, honeysuckle as well. Um, and I could show you a big fat caterpillar over here too on the, some of the native milkweed. Yes. I was just uh, spotted one over here. This milkweed too, this native, these will, they grow in, uh, with, uh, they spread in rhythms. So they, uh, if you have a drip system, they follow your drip system beautifully. Mm. This is another uh, milkweed that is safe in the garden. Um, it's called swamp milkweed. Okay. Uh, I will allow it in the garden because it dies uh, back uh, naturally in uh, uh, late summer. Uh -huh. you, you cannot have milkweed in your yard in the Bay Area that doesn't uh, go deciduous I by see. itself. I see. Or else you have big, big problems for the butterflies. And then this, I don't see this plant over on the other side. What is this nice purple? Oh, I'd have to look that up too. 
Interesting. I just, it's one of the few that I, the name is slipping me. And the, and the uh, blue flower here? Salvia. Aha. This is a lovely salvia that. Do you know the name? I would have to look that up too. Okay. But it's um, kind of a bog salvia. Uh, this particular one grows up straight, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. I have seen it lay down in mm -hmm. some areas. It's not always that attractive. Aha. Uh -huh. And then this is another passiflora. Yes. yes. And this is uh, the, these passifloras the, the, um, are are host plants for that little butterfly, the Gulf fritillaria uh -huh. butterfly. So they'll actually, this is the own, they'll they'll lay their eggs on there, and then they'll eat the foliage, and um, uh, it's really beneficial for the yard to to have them. Now and that, they just they thrive in our area. Just, are those hollyhocks? Uh, what are, what are those? Uh, or detour? Uh, it's a digitalis. Digitalis, okay. Hollyhocks, the deer will eat. I okay. have tried them out here, and they they don't they don't work. The deer the deer really like them as well. This is the probably the main milkweed you'll want in your yard. This is the narrow for leaf, butterflies for butterflies, and it's native. This is narrow leaf, and here's a little guy on here. Ah. This is what you want. That's a monarch. That's a monarch. They lay their eggs. The butterfly will lay their egg on this. And How many they... eggs will will that caterpillar lay? Uh, well, the butterfly laid laid the egg. Okay. Okay, so... and now Mr. Caterpillar is going to eat until he's so fat he's ready to go into a cocoon. I see. And, and and how many how many eggs did the the butterfly lay? Uh, um, amazingly enough, they they only lay a few eggs on each plant. Uh huh. So that that makes them quite fragile. It uh, does. And an, another um, little problem that we get is the the wasps mm. uh, love to come and eat the larvae. I see. So not everything is meant to live. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. they'll come and eat a, a large amount of the larvae too. Mm hmm. So, uh, and this is milkweed as well. You mm -hmm. always know you have little visitors in your yard when you see these little holes. I love seeing all this. Most gardeners don't like that, but I appreciate seeing life in the garden. So I see lots of holes, which means we have caterpillars. Is that another clematis back there? That's jasmine. Okay. And, uh... We have the tricolor, uh, I'm escaping the lantana, the tricolor lantana. Right. And then what is, what is, what do we have here? Oh gosh, you know, I forget the name of that one too. Okay, and then you've got rock, several kinds of yarrow. Yeah, lots of yarrow. The butterflies uh, love the yarrow. And more hellebore, more hellebores. And then what's this uh, bright? Uh, Snapdragons. Okay, so you got Another snap butterfly fave. And then you have some astilbe. Yes. And then what's th what's this purple? Uh, Har uh, haracha. Har haracha. Is it done blooming? It's not. It, right. in this that area, has a tiny little bloom. Yeah, uh -huh. it's um, it's pretty happy here. It'll probably bloom through most of the summer. Uh huh. And are there any other favorite plants? Um, like, I th I th love the yeah. This is so fabulous. It's, bees just love it. The Russian sage. Mm -hmm. But again, on this kind of a garden, it has to stay on the outskirts mm -hmm. because it really doesn't like water. Ah. So it has to hang out on the edge. And the and then these are uh, lilies. Trumpet lilies. Trumpet lilies mm -hmm. and. Um, how many plants have you purchased this year, do you know? Oh, probably about a few hundred. A few hundred. and no, four-inch four plants because I'm still building. Uh -huh. uh, I am hope to get to a, a point soon where it's, which it could be even next year, where the garden's just going to regenerate and take care of itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think we're almost there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, between reseeding and the perennials, I, th I think we're close. Mm -hmm. We're almost there where I can just um, 
it will maintain itself. I can clear things away after the uh, a cycle is complete and um, just sit back and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that would be around $2,500 a year in plants during the building? Probably, that sounds close. Period. Yeah, that sounds close. Um, and then you've got grapeseed compost. Um, Describe the soil care from year one when you just killed the grass to the, the present time. How okay. First, the, the first plants that uh, I installed were drought tolerant plants. Uh -huh. I, I was going for a bee, drought tolerant and bees. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't have to do much at all. In fact, I didn't add any compost at all. Uh -huh. Did you put bark to stop the weeds growing back or just um, plant densely? We, I, I did put bark uh, the first the first year. Okay. Yeah, to cover. No, still no irrigation. Uh, it was hand watered and um, and really I, that first year didn't do anything to the soil but just install the plants. And it was lavender, Russian sage, um, the olive, uh, they were all just, um, just our our first inspiration, mm -hmm. and it was so exciting to see the um, the nature that came to the yard that we I just kept going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then ended up having to remove the drought tolerant things from the inner inner garden um, because the uh, other flowers needed uh, a little bit more water, mm -hmm. so. That's how it all started. And then I did have to, once I uh, cultivated some compost, the grape um, com the compost. grape seed compost, yeah. And the marin zone, I, I used that as well to give a little more nutrition to the, the soil. And where did you get the marin zone? Uh, at the um, soil uh, uh, at, place at, near the dump. Okay, at, ANS, ANS landscape. ANS, yeah. Okay. And that, that's, I've been so happy with it. Mm. And how many how many yards of the of the two have did you did you get overall? Uh, it was probably it's it's a it's a couple of yards uh, a year I use. Okay, so that would be about ten yards overall yeah. since beginning. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. I like to uh, cut everything back in the fall uh, around September October and then put a layer of compost down. Mm -hmm. And when it's all cut back, does it look bad to your eye? No. Okay. I still have my a few bones. I have mm -hmm. the You have olives, the olives. And I have the, um, the trellises with the passion vine that go until um, late fall. Yeah. So I have that and there's still a lot of And the hellebores. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, in, de in December, the hellebores are all popping up. So there's really not a lot of bareness in the yard. Um, I mean, it's certainly not like it is now, but um, you, have to in you have to appreciate the change. That's mm. what it's, the garden's constantly in motion, constantly changing. What, what is that spectacular purple stem plant? I would have to look that up uh, for you. Uh, it's absolutely uh, phenomenal um, as far as what it attracts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I think everybody stops at that hub, the bees, yeah. the butterflies, and it starts out, and it re I'm, I've noticed it's reseeding all by itself in the yard. Mm. Um, it's something that I picked up at Annie's Annuals. Here's another, here's it just starting. Uh -huh. There's something that dropped, a seed or something. Uh -huh. It starts small and it just goes to town. Uh -huh. So, and is Annie, Annie's Annuals your main source? Yes. Okay, yes, so that then we'd have to revise our costs upward for... Yes, for, for, yes it's not cheap. <laughs> for, it's for, not cheap. Four, four inches cost with a gallon normally yes. cost. Okay. Yes, but I have... Uh, I have found that if you have a little bit of patience, it pays off because those four inch plants will do what you want them to do. Absolutely, particularly with these. And how many of these are bulbs and seeds versus four inch plants? Uh, most of them are, most of them are plants. Mm -hmm. This is 
this is probably the second year where I'm getting reseeding, uh -huh. where the, the Queen Anne's lace, there was nothing planted for this year. Um, there was no, um, this plant here that we're talking about, I didn't plant any new ones, so mm -hmm. it's just regenerating itself. The fever few, mm -hmm. that's all regenerated itself, and I, I pulled out a, probably two or three garbage bags this year of it, just right. to make room for the new, the, the end of the summer echinacea and dahlias that were coming up because there was, they had receded so heavily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and n now I, I guess the, the biggest downside for something like this, if you're not as hands-on with, with a good eye as you are, would be, I don't imagine anyone could, could get a gardener to replicate something like this and, and balance the color and, you know, because uh, this is probably about a thousand percent more complex. I mean, if we look around the neighborhood, either, you know, with what I'm going to be doing or, you know, no, but they just have to decide how they're going to prune, right. you know, right. those or, you know, come in and do a little bit. There's so so the price is maintenance um and and having good taste uh which which has a some or your own, or your own taste <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. what, where i might love something someone else might not love it and right it's just a matter of and it's experimental too mm -hmm. you have to be willing to be able to say oh that doesn't work there and pull it up and put it somewhere else right and you also have to like people because you're going to be pestered a lot if you have a garden that's nice. You do. If it's a, <laughs> it, it, it normally would be in the backyard, but I don't have enough sun in the backyard. Right. So my only choice was front yard. Right. And right. it turned out to be such a, a fun event. Right. And obviously I've asked to, to film you. How many people a year kind of want to know about your garden? There's dozens. Doesn't, yeah. We, people, people will stop, people will come to the door yeah. and just said, what's going on here? Yeah, what yeah. Do, how, do, how do we do this? What do we do? Right. And um, it's interesting. People like flowers. Yeah. Like actual flowers. Yes, yeah. And that's what it's about. Right, right. So do butterflies. So yeah. do bees. So uh, if, you're, if you're growing things for the, the, the birds and the bees and butterflies, <laughs> you're going to want flowers. Yeah. And it's really what gardens used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, people, their passion, their time was spent in gardens rather than in front of a screen. Right. Uh, they were in their yard and they were they were doing flowers. Yeah. You can see it in in the history with um, people's gardens. And mm -hmm. Just pulling that a little bit back in is mm -hmm. can be very exciting. Yeah. So if you have two or three hours a week, uh, a good eye and a three thousand dollar budget mm -hmm. uh you can slowly transform a bit of lawn like that which is right. about the same size into a former lawn like this uh and i think you could do it even less mm -hmm. if you were a little bit more patient with seeds uh -huh. because they can be uh if you were to grow things from seed on your own, yeah, um, I think you could probably stretch that a little further. No doubt, yeah, because you, you can buy bulbs and uh -huh. seeds, you know, echinacea uh -huh. seeds and things yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's. Uh, thank you very much for. Uh, and one final thing: is there any um, animal ha habitat? I think you, you mentioned on the olives that, uh, that the butterflies go in there. Do they actually? produce any fruit and if so do any animals like the olive fruits uh they they these particular these only olives do not produce fruit uh -huh. um and, uh, which is actually beneficial for us because uh -huh. it, where i they're not messy yeah um and it, it's, it's a hiding place we sure. use it for a, a kind of a border and a hiding place is that a wilsonii over there that's a fruit less i mean they fruit don't fruit less they don't fruit it's as much it's not supposed to it's not supposed to produce fruit. Uh huh. And, and have you seen any? I have not. Okay. I have not. Yeah, I'm told that that, that for the for the trees, the, the, 
when they say fruitless, they mean less fruit as opposed to, I, I was told I couldn't buy an olive that would be a tree that had absolutely zero fruit. I so, have, but maybe you found it. All right, well, I haven't <laughs> had any issues with fruit. Uh huh. It almost looks like it's going to produce fruit and then it, it stops. Mm, interesting. So, it's, uh, I've never had a fruit issue with it. Oh, and, 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 and then this plant, do you happen to know the name? I would have to look it up. It's yeah. traditionally a shade, a shade plant. Um, I'm just blanking on the name. And then that looks like a datura. Oh, the tree? The trumpet? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Super easy to grow here in the Bay Area. Yes. All right. Well, uh, thank you again. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you, uh, Dane. Uh, wonderful meeting you and getting to know your beautiful work. I'm so impressed. Very impressed with everything you do. All right. Take care. You too.